I will be talking about the recent paper in JOSBT where we use brain imaging to quantify some of the motor control changes after ACL injury. As this audience understands, ACL injury is a relatively common occurrence in our young and active athletes. What's perhaps more concerning is that up to 70% of these injuries are non-contact in nature, meaning the individual loses neuromuscular control of their knee, it collapses to midline, and overloads the ACL. This non-contact nature of the injury may indicate there are some errors going on in motor coordination or how the nervous system is programming movement which led to the initial, initial injury. Perhaps most pressing to this audience and for clinicians is that when we return our athletes to very high level activity, they may have an elevated risk of second injury. And as any physician or therapist will tell you, it's absolutely heartbreaking to spend months, even years with an athlete or active person than to have them re-injure um, it's very distressing. So we thought we would try to figure out is there anything we could possibly do in our therapy or anything we might be missing. One thing I'd like to highlight regarding what we might be missing in our, in our current therapy, this is um, Ben Rower's work out of the University of Delaware. They showed at two years after injury on your right that patients will recover quadriceps strength, but they don't necessarily recover utilization of the knee during gait. So even though they're strong again, they're not using their knee like they do their uninjured side. And Dr. Meyer and colleagues at, in Cincinnati, they've gone on to show that there's actually no association from time from the injury or surgery and recovery of these functional deficits that tend to persist. We hypothesize that this may be due partially to a neuroplastic mechanism you know, after the ACL rupture, we have the combined joint mechanical instability and the associated inflammation and edema. But also, there are disruption of the mechanoreceptors. The ACL happens to be highly innervated with these receptors that tell your nervous system where your knee is in space. And we know from longitudinal studies that these receptors do not regrow with reconstruction techniques. This causes a disruption to the overall afferent signal coming into the nervous system from the knee and we know this contributes to the shutdown of the muscles around the knee, specifically the quadriceps immediate inhibition that we see, but also some changes in spinal cord excitability and some cortical changes. This leads to an overall low-level joint deaffrontation effect where the nervous system must reorganize to maintain motor control in the absence of the sensory input it would normally get from the ACL. In trying to measure this nervous system reorganization, we utilized neuroimaging. We're using a normal MRI to complete functional imaging. What we did, we had individuals complete repeated cycles of knee flexion extension and then rest while laying in the MRI scanner. So this is what the movement looked like. As you may notice, it is very simple. It's not very complex. The reason for this is if the head moves anything more than a millimeter, the data is not usable. So we had to develop a knee motor task that would be allowed to be used in the MRI environment. And so you could think of this as just a simple assay of your brain's activation pattern to control the knee. And what you'll see here, this is how the brain turns on in red, is if you've torn your ACL. And in blue is how your brain turns on if you haven't torn your ACL to engage in that simple knee motor task. So as you can probably just qualitatively see, there's a lot more red than blue. Those with ACL injury have a different brain activation pattern, even for this very simple knee movement. Our study utilized 15 ACL reconstructed individuals and 15 match controls. The time from surgery was somewhat variable. So we had six months up to five years. They were all returned to their high-level sports or activities. And they were very tightly matched to the control group. That is a major component of any neuroimaging study. Because brain activity could be highly variable based on any experience. So these were two very tightly matched groups. And they were all left ACLR reconstructed individuals with the right knee having no injury history. That will be important when we talk about some of the brain activation differences. We had three regions of activation that increased if, you, if they've torn their ACL, and two regions that decreased. I'll talk about each one for just a minute or two. 
One of the regions that increase activity is in the occipital cortex. This is called your lingual gyrus. What this region does, it processes congruent sensory or proprioceptive and visual spatial information for motor control. And we hypothesize that due to the disrupted and altered sensory input from the ACL, this area increases activity to supplement motor planning with more visual spatial information due to the disrupted sensory information. You know, the region that activated more was the secondary somatosensory area. This area tends to only activate when you're in pain. However, it turned on in our cohort of ACL reconstructed individuals. They were all not experiencing pain at the time. This gives an interesting insight that just to move their knee, their brain may be turning on and experiencing that pain memory due to the, tra the traumatic ACL event. The contralateral, or in this case, right motor cortex, because these are all left knee injured individuals, also had to activate more to generate this knee movement. This makes some sense that anyone who's treated these patients, you see that they have immediate quadriceps shutdown, so the brain has to work a little bit harder to generate the same contractions and the same movement. Interestingly, we found that the same side motor cortex and cerebellum, they activated less. What's interesting about the lower extremity is that your same side cortex and cerebellum will turn on to suppress your other side from moving. So as they're moving their left knee, their injured knee, this area would normally turn on to keep your other side from moving since your lower extremity likes to function together bilaterally. We think the extensive unilateral therapy makes the brain a little more neurally efficient at suppressing the other side from moving. And this may play a role in second injury risk, but that's largely speculation with these data. So what might this rehabilitation program look like if we were going to try to target some of these neuroplastic factors? One thing to keep in mind is that in a secondary analysis of several studies that looked at actual injury events, ACL injury tends to occur in a complex game situation. There is 80% of the injuries in these studies occurred with a ball or another player within a meter. So our athletes are visually distracted or cognitively occupied during the injury event. One way to try to target this over-reliance on visual feedback for motor control, if you remember the lingual gyrus increased activity, we think that's due to increased use of vision to program motion due to the lost ACL, is our lab has been experimenting with these stroboscopic glasses. Essentially, you put them on, and you can decide how much visual feedback people will experience. What you're seeing on the screen, was developed by Nike. Um, they no longer have the patent. I have no financial stake in the company that makes it. Um, makes them now. It's called Synaptic. There's three or four other companies. But essentially, you can decide how much visual feedback to get. You can have the shutter speed be very high, very low. This gives you a lot of flexibility and another progression you could add to your therapy. Now, for those of you not looking to spend a couple hundred dollars on fancy glasses, another way to think about therapy is to what you have this patient focus on. Normally, we have people focus on their joints and space, focus on contracting a muscle. But this may be feeding into the increased use of vision for motor control. You would suggest, and Anna Benjaminese and Ali Gochler at, in the Netherlands have done a lot of great work for this, as well as Hugh and Greg Meyer in Cincinnati, looking at external focus. So instead of thinking about where your knee is in space, focus on the bar to keep balance, focus on a target. Or you could use this fancy knee brace. However, recently there's been some interesting apps developed for your smartphone that will vibrate if you go out of position. So now people can focus on their environment and you could put a smartphone on someone's knee with a $2 app and they can vibrate if they go into valgus. It's just another example. And then one more thing I'd like to uh, mention is that our lab is also working on some virtual reality projects. Now you may immediately think this is very expensive and I don't have time or space for this in my clinic. Um, I have a grad student who's working on this, which you'll see in the upper right. This is Google Cardboard. This costs $8, and if you have a smartphone, all the apps are free. You just drop your smartphone in it. What we're doing in our clinic is we would go to the field or wherever our athletes are participating, maybe it's a basketball court. We take a 360 picture, drop our smartphone in the Google Cardboard, and for $8, that's how much the cardboard costs, you can put your athlete on the field. And then they can do their quad sets or their exercise in your clinic. So if it's tough to bring the athlete to the field, bring the field to your clinic. And that's just one quick, easy way to address some of these visual processing items after injury. There are some limitations with this study. 
Um, we do not know if these, in, if these things started before the injury. These could be injury risk factors. They may not all be induced by the injury. This is also a combined effect of surgery, rehab, and the injury. And also, the MRI has specific limitations that we couldn't do a very advanced motor task. So I would encourage clinicians out there to just think about neuroplasticity in your interventions. You can just make small, small changes to your therapy, such as focus of attention, and that could drastically change how the brain turns on to do the movement and may improve your patient outcomes. I have a lot of great collaborators over the last few years, especially the team at Ohio State where I did this work, and my advisor, Dr. Onadi. Um, thank you very much.